Institutions uh, meeting. I know that there are folks that are still signing in, so I at least wanted to say good morning. I hope everyone is doing well uh, and enjoying a little bit of snow in Denver. Uh, we're going to wait about a minute or two, and I'm looking through to see if we have a quorum of HSSA members. Good morning, Masha. Good morning, Maria. Myra. Let's see, all Josh is on. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let's see, Britta is on. Good morning. We still have a few other folks who are texting me that they're jumping on. So we'll hold for just one moment. Um, I just want to tell you um, also, good morning, everybody. Um, this time when I logged on, it literally made me go back and enter like I'm a new person. So I don't know what we did differently, uh, but it asked for, you know, contact information. So that might be the delay. It's, um, it's logging you in like a guest. So we're having all of you log in just like a guest every time. And then we promote you to a panelist. And so the way that works with Zoom is it's always gonna ask you for an email and your name. Awesome. Well, thank you, Miss Sabrina on top of. <laughs> You're welcome. We're finally getting used to all this technology. It's only taken a couple of years, right? <laughs> Good morning, Melanie. And I think while folks are joining, I'll start go through the agenda and then the hope is that I know Maria is joining us and a few other of the board members I'm looking to see who else is not on I think we have I see Maria is on good I see Jenny's on all right we have a quorum so good morning my name is Daryl Watson I'm the chair of the housing stability strategic advisor board my pronouns are he him I want to thank you all for dedicating this time with us this morning to discuss important issues um, facing the cities and the communities that we each each of us serve. I wanted to quickly walk through what today's agenda is going to look like. Uh, thank you so much for sharing the PowerPoint. As soon as that comes up, it blows up all of my notes. But thank you so much, Kathy. I <laughs> so appreciate all that you do behind the scenes. Uh, to make sure that these meetings uh, function well. So we'll have uh, public comments, about two minutes for each member of the community. If you would like to make comments specifically to agenda items, uh, please raise your hand. We will uh, um, uh, remove your mute and allow you to speak for two minutes. Thank you for keeping your comments specific to the issue and not to in individual persons. We appreciate you being here and we appreciate your feedback. Uh, the board will uh, then call the meeting to order. We'll approve the minutes. Uh, Britta Fisher will provide an executive director update. Um, we will review as far as old business, our expanding housing affordability uh, follow-up. Thank you so much, Brad, for coming back a, a second month in a row. We appreciate you and the time and uh, the effort your team and CDP has been uh, uh, see, uh have been has been focusing on um, enhancing uh, housing affordability. So we appreciate all the work you've done over these past months. Um, I'll do a quick review of uh, board governance, which will touch a little bit on the auditor's report, as well as our bylaws and other steps that we take within HSSA to make sure that we are being transparent in the work that we're doing and that we are permitting community, uh, each of you that are attending this call, uh, the opportunity to engage with us. Um, after that, we'll have a presentation of uh, the pillars from our, um, um, uh, our strategic plan and a quick discussion from our HSA advisors, and then we will adjourn the call, hopefully right on time um, at an hour and a half for this meeting. So uh, let me, uh, Kathy, let me just check and see if folks are on the call or Sabrina uh, that are members of the public and I'm looking through folks who are signed up. Individuals have any comments, any questions for host or for HSSA members, uh, please raise your hand and unmute. You'll have uh, two minutes uh, to make comments uh, and then we'll move on to calling the meeting to order. So I'm thanks, Daryl. I'm not seeing anybody at this time. 
Yeah, I'm looking around as well, not seeing any hands, not seeing any comments, not seeing any additional folks. To that point, let me ask a question, Sabrina and, and, and Kathy, how far, uh, I mean, when it comes to invites for this meeting, is the link distributed to the communities that were participating in the executive uh, committee meetings as we were building up to the five-year plan, or is it just simply the link to this meeting is on the landing page for HSSA, and if folks go on that landing page, they have access to it? Um, it's on the landing page for HSSA, and then we've been promoting it in our external newsletters, and we'll continue to do so. So that should go, that should include everybody who was in the executive committee and a wide variety of other partners as well. Perfect. Good to know. Good to know. Let me just wait one more moment. I do not see any members of the public. So why don't we move, uh, advance the slide. And thank you so much, uh, Katie. So for HSSA members, um, for the approval of minutes and Katie uh, and Sabrina, when were the minutes sent out? Uh, normally we receive them within the, the week of the meeting. Um, were those sent out uh, this week? Um, I have to be really honest. I think we sent them out earlier than that when we sent the um, invite to the meeting. And Katie, I need to double check if they were attached to the meeting invite. I've been traveling this week. I did not receive that update. So I just wanted to make sure that board members were able to review the uh, minutes from last week, uh, last month's meeting. So we can just I'm, check. I'm really sorry. I actually don't see them on there. We may need to hold those till next month and approve those with this month's meet, meeting minutes. I apologize. Mm -hmm. I think we missed that. No, no problem. And so I, I guess for us, for the board, I think having kind of a set cadence of prior, the week prior to the meeting, having the minutes uh, sent, I, I thought that I, I saw something, but I, I couldn't find it this morning as well. So thank you so much, Katie, and thank you, Sabrina. And for the board, the way the, um, the, the, this works, if the minutes aren't reviewed and approved, we could just simply add them to the March meeting. So we'll be approving the, uh, the January and February um, minutes of meetings during our March meeting. So thanks again, uh, Katie and Sabrina. Uh, you could advance to the next slide. And that's uh, Britta's update. So Britta, if you would like to take the floor. Thank you, Chair Daryl. And uh, thank you to all of our housing strategic advisors who are here and uh, to our our public members who are observing as well. Good morning and uh, good to be with you on this Friday. Uh, Fridays always have a nice bit of energy in the morning. I hope it was that way for you. Uh, today, I wanna just talk about a few highlights of some things that have happened. Uh, as executive director of the Department of Housing Stability, I'm just really pleased to report that we are adding people um, to our team uh, to help get a lot of this big work done. You've seen our ambitious strategic plan and uh, we're really grateful to those who've uh, chosen to help with our, our mission here. And we'll be talking about that and one of our new members at the end of my comments. Um, also wanted to make sure that you know that we are getting those American Rescue Plan Act dollars out the door and into community partners' hands uh, in order to help really see our recovery to COVID-19 um, be actualized. And so one of those that just recently passed was $3.9 million of expansion uh, to Colorado Village Collaborative for safe outdoor spaces. And so that will help fund four sites up from two and to serve 371 households uh, here in 2022. So grateful to those partners and, and grateful to council for passing that uh, as well. We also on the recovery front had a couple of consultations with our community and partners on February 11th and 16th on Home ARP. So the home program has an American Rescue Plan Act allocation as well. And we took 
input from the community about how we would utilize that. And again, uh, thank you to all who participated. If you still haven't gotten your input in, there is a chance to complete the survey. And uh, Katie did send that via v email to the Housing Stability Strategic Advisors. Uh, so please do look for that if you still wanna get your comments in. Next, I uh, wanted to make sure everyone is aware of our housing surge. As you may be aware, in the fall, uh, we put out a housing surge with our community partners to really help prime our efforts uh, as we shift from more of a response to COVID-19 to more recovery and getting more of those resources out the door. Uh, we were successful in that surge in uh, seeing more than 300 um, households um, get uh, housed, and our goal had been 200. And with that success, we decided, let's go more ambitious. Uh, that's what our community partners said. And so we, uh, in this 100-day surge, will be uh, having a goal of 400 households uh, being housed with those new emergency housing vouchers with some of our rapid uh, rehousing and rapid re resolution um, funds. And so we have all of those things plus supportive housing that we are utilizing to reach our goals. And we're just so proud of our partners that do this work every day and have been working in even tighter collaboration to see how we can do it even better and faster uh, to get as many people to housing resources as quickly as possible. So again, thanks to the community uh, for supporting this uh, ambitious goal that we really need to deliver on. And then finally, I wanted to share one thing on the policy front. Um, Brad will be talking also on the policy front about expanding housing affordability, but I also wanted to uh, just bring up one of the other strategic plan items, which is our prioritization policy. Uh, so we want to help combat displacement. And so we're proposing a prioritization policy that would provide households who are at risk of displacement or who have been displaced uh, from their neighborhood or from Denver, uh, they would get priority access to newly developed or preserved affordable housing. And so that's where the name prioritization comes in. So that goal is really to help Denver residents uh, at risk of displacement remain in neighborhoods and for those who have been displaced to return to their neighborhoods or, or Denver as a whole. So. There will be opportunities to attend some input sessions on this policy coming up. And we just wanna make you aware that that is going to be coming probably around April or so. So uh, that'll be soon here and want to give you the heads up. Finally, I said I would talk about one of the, the new folks who has come to our team. And I just wanted to uh, give a shout out and a warm uh, welcome to Renee Gallegos, who is our new Deputy Director of Housing Opportunity. Uh, she comes with a wealth of, of knowledge and expertise across housing finance, housing development. Um, she has done all sorts of things in our community, and we're so fortunate to have her here with her nonprofit experience, her municipal experience from Boulder, um, and we're excited for her to walk through some things today uh, in this meeting as well. So uh, with that, Daryl, that's the end of my report today. Hey, welcome, Renee. Thank you so much for uh, leaning in and uh, becoming a, a, a larger part of this team. And so I look forward to uh, collaborating and coordinating and getting to know you uh, a lot better. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, and, and Katie, I want to apologize. I, I think it's important to call folks by their name <laughs> correctly. And I think no I've been tied tongue. <laughs> throughout calling you Kathy, Kathy, Kathy. <laughs> and uh, uh, I have too many Catherines in my life. And they all go by Kathy. And so uh, my apologies, I want to model that behavior and say <laughs> you for now, from now on, I will refer to you as Katie. It's so no thank problem, you so thank much. you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sabrina, I see your hand. 
Thanks, Daryl. Um, I just wanted to also take a quick moment to introduce Jack Wiley, who's also on the call today. Um, Jack is our new government affairs officer, and so he's um, filling the position. You may all remember Elvis previously, um, spent a lot of time with you all, and so this is um, Elvis's um, replacement, and so we're really excited to have Jack on board. Um, Jack and I actually worked together at the state at the Department of Personnel and Administration a number of years ago, and he's been there since so we just snagged him and brought him over to host. We're really excited to have him. He has a wealth of legislative knowledge and um, he's getting up to speed on all things city council. But I just wanted to let you know that he's here with us and we're excited to have him on board as well. And you'll be um, getting a, an opportunity to interact with him a lot more in days and weeks to come. So welcome, Jack. Same to you, Jack. Looking forward to uh, getting to know you better. I'm familiar with your work with the state, and so I'm um, excited to, uh, to be able to collaborate with you uh, within the city. And with that, I think we're turning this back over to Brad, unless there are any other comments. And actually, Brad, before you jump in, um, uh, Britta, I had a quick question for you on the policy um, uh, prioritization policy consultation process. We received an email from Polly um, around February 28th. Is that a, just a specific touch point meeting that will roll into the larger process? If, if, if you're familiar with that, that, that date and time, do you mind sharing a little bit as to what that was? I'm actually gonna call on Jennifer Bice, uh, who uh, works with Polly to talk a little bit more about that meeting. She'll have a little more information. Thanks, Britta, and great question, Daryl. Um, yes, so HSSA members, you likely received an invitation to one of two sessions um, that are the week of February 28th on prioritization policy. We are starting with some targeted stakeholder engagement um, at this earlier stage in our process. So we're looking to invite um, folks from community groups, um, as well as developers and property managers and folks who'd be impacted by this policy to get some early feedback and also wanted to include our HSSA advisors in that as well. So please do join us if you're able. Um, we will then be taking that input and using that to, to really inform the policy and then looking to do broader um, community, a broader community meeting and engagement um, later in uh, this year. So hopefully we'll, we'll see some of you there. Thank you so much, Jennifer. That was very helpful. Uh, and so now, Brad, we'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Daryl. Good morning, Strategic Advisors. Again, Brad Weinig, Director of Catalytic Projects for uh, HOST. And last month, as you recall, we discussed um, in, in depth kind of this expanding housing affordability policy conversation. As a quick reminder, this is a joint policy effort between HOST and our peers in community planning and development to um, update our linkage fee, right size our linkage fee, as well as introduce an exciting new mandatory or inclusionary housing program that we're very excited about. Um, at this uh, meeting a month ago, uh, Randy in particular, I'm, I, I don't think I see Randy on the attendee list today, but I have had a chance to connect with him individually between then and now, uh, brought up that there wasn't any kind of specific address of um, our, our neighbors and friends with disabilities and as part of that EHA conversation. He was right to, to bring it up. And so I wanted to just quickly update this body on um, conversations that we um, have had internally and, and continue to have as part of, as a kind of result of that, that conversation. So quickly we did, the EHA team did get a chance to meet um, with our peers in the um, community planning and development division who oversee our buildings and our architects and engineers, just the experts, frankly, on kind of what our codes require. Got a briefing on kind of what is and is not in place. So quickly, um, for those that, that don't know, kind of the accessibility requirements live within the city's building code appendix R, which comes directly from the, the state statute that um, kind of drives statewide accessibility requirements in all new buildings. Um, appendix R generally applies primarily to, to single family duplex and, and townhome developments. Uh, within, that, uh, within that appendix, a, a development must earn a certain minimum number of points by providing different types of accessible units, type A and type B accessible units. Um, but more importantly, uh, the International Building Code really governs larger developments, including most condos and apartment communities, which I think is, will be mostly impacted with this expanding housing affordability effort. Um, meeting IBC standards generally exceeds um, all Appendix R requirements kind of by definition. However, 
in talking with um, our, our chief building officer and in conversations with, with Randy in particular, I kind of learned that really fully accessible units, those that, that, that really accommodate all mobility needs and have grab bars, low threshold showers, et cetera, are not necessarily required in, in residential developments in the same way that they are for um, like a hotel development, for example. And so, except for in cases of, of reasonable accommodation. So I think that's the, the nature of one of, you know, Randy's primary concerns and the concerns of the overall kind of disabled community that we need to, as a city, think through um, what we might do about it. So you wanna to go to the next slide, Katie. Um, considerations and, and potential next steps for us as a city. So quickly, uh, and these, by the way, are not um, you know, mutually exclusive options either. We're having conversations kind of across, across these. Uh, the EHA team has consulted initially with our, um, with, our, with our third party consultant, as you recall, feasibility analysis is a big part of EHA. And so we've asked them to do some further digging and research and, and, and try to help us come up with an estimate of really what is the kind of marginal cost in order to you know, create or convert a unit into a more universally designed, fully accessible unit so that we have an idea of the scale of the kind of economic components, which, which will obviously be an important part of any policy consideration. And then thinking through the potential avenues for change you know, within the expanding housing affordability, um, you know, while, while the impact would be limited to new affordable units kind of included within new mandatory affordable housing developments, it's still worth, I think, having the conversation. And it would, you know, likely within that policy need to be like an option available to developers in exchange for perhaps fewer income restricted units, which, you know, is, is, is potentially a difficult trade off given the purpose of the overall policy, but one that we will continue to discuss because, you know, it is it is important to um, keep in mind. Uh, on, on a slightly more broader scale, I think there's also things that we as a whole department outside of EHA necessarily, but across everything we do might, might also consider in our policies and procedures, probably a you know, slightly broader impact than, than the EHA um, and could you know, potentially include say additional funding, again, based on some of those economic analyses to consider providing additional funding to support the creation or conversion of accessible and universally designed homes kind of within our portfolio of both funded and, and policy driven um, apartment and, and condo communities. And then um, I think importantly on, on the broadest scale, the broadest reach applying to all uh, buildings in Denver as I uh, attempted to mention, but not as eloquently as I would have liked in the last meeting that the Denver building code is actually being updated through a, a public process right now. There's a link to the, to the website um, within these, the slide deck. I also shared it with, with Randy for him to um, distribute to his network as well. And he was appreciative. Um, it, it, it does apply across buildings in Denver across the board. The process is ongoing. Um, it's kind of midstream right now. They have already received kind of a first set of, of public comments, but certainly updates have not been finalized and ultimately like any policy needs to kind of go through a legislative review process. And so I, you know, I encouraged him that it's also, you know, important for, for that conversation to be elevated at that level and to have those conversations. And so, um, Again, wanted to provide you with a brief update. We are continuing to have the conversation. We did hear Randy and we wanna make sincere efforts to, to make changes. We just wanna make sure we do it thoughtfully and in a way that will actually affect change. So that's the update from me. Thank you, Brad. I just wanted to say oh, hey, thank Randy. you. I am here, I got here late, but th thank you very much for your response to this. And I'm just really excited to be able to have something I can take back to my community to show them that we are doing something to help address their needs. Yeah, and thank you, Randy, for your leadership in that regard. We appreciate it. And Myra as well, um, I thank you for, for, for sharing your thoughts via email. Um, I, you know, I, I attended the follow-up with you as well and would be happy to continue to have the conversation, but I hope my being here today is evidence that you know, we heard it and we're, we're, we're considering what we can do. So thank you all for your leadership. So Brad, thank you so much for sharing that. Randy, thank you for bringing that forward at, at our last meeting. I have a quick follow-up on that piece before I open it up for um, HSSA members for any additional questions we have around, H, um, around the EHA uh, plan. So the work that's being done by the um, through Denver Building Code, that process is separate. Um, is this an addendum to a EHA that will be going through the council process that you're going to list any of these um, impacts to uh, um, 
folks with different abilities? Um, is any of that going to be attached to EHA as it goes through the process? Um, so I think there are a couple different questions in there, Daryl. So one, yes, the building code update process is a separate and distinct process from the expanding housing affordability policy effort. And, and so, you know, that that is something that, that that will certainly impact everything that, you know, we do within within the built environment realm, right? Because that's a citywide kind of building code standard, regardless of whether it's affordable housing or a office building or a, you know, shopping center, right? And so that's, that's yeah. an important conversation to continue having. With respect to EHA and our sphere of influence, I think what I was trying to elevate was that we are continuing to have those, these kinds of conversations of what we can do specifically within EHA um, to, to meaningfully address the concerns that Randy raised. And yes, anything that we were able to incorporate in there will also be incorporated into the revised DRMC and the zoning code languages and the rules and regs that are all part of the package that ultimately our planning board and city council will be reviewing um, through the legislative process in the next quarter. And to add on to that question, Brad, so for any, um, as you go through rules and regs, uh, impacts from other plans, whether it's a building code or other plans that are currently existing that, that uh, directs you as to how EHA can be executed, um, reviewed the transparency of EHA. Do you, within your plan, as you go through rules and reg, um, highlight these are the two, three, four plans, whether it's something as broad as Comprehensive Plan 2040 or as targeted as um, um, uh, Blueprint Denver or whatever. I'm not, I'm just throwing things out, but do you specifically highlight which pl existing plans inform some of the targets within EHA? So folks know, okay, EHA may not uh, explicitly state this, this and this and how it impacts communities like the building code, um, the Denver building code plan that's going through, but it's Im impacted by these other plans. So we don't have to have an exhaustive um, EHA. So yes, I know that's a very long question, comment, statement. Yes, I mean, so I think one. multiple plans, including say Blueprint Denver and comprehensive plans, neighborhood plans, other kind of relevant um, city policies and plans are, are referenced, you know, when we can. I'll, that said, I think there's there's a lot to, to enumerate and, and certainly any development, regardless of whether host is involved or not, does have to, you know, live by the building codes of, of the city and county of Denver, which is why, again, I think it's really important to continue the conversation that we started with that process and have, you know, and have, you know, advocates continue to push on that front as well, because that, that will kind of impl have implications, not just within EHA, but all other kinds of built environment, built realms, neighborhood plans that the city kind of undertakes. And so it's, you know, they, they, they designed to work among and between one another. Um, it, it lives in the, in, the, in the revised municipal code, which is ultimately where we, we create the new legal language as part of the EHA. And that also, you know, is, is where our building code and, and other kind of obligations and rules and regs live. Okay, thanks, Brad. So let me uh, walk around the room a little bit. Myra, I wanted to provide space for you if you chose to um, share. I know that you had uh, some um, uh, comments um, or question uh, following our last meeting. I saw your response in, uh, in the chat saying thank you to Brad for what he shared. I am wondering if you had any additional questions to start this off, and then I want to, I'll go around the room to each of our HASA members to um, see if they have additional questions for Brad. Thank you. I don't have any additional questions. I'm really happy that um, to hear that our voices were heard and, and that something is being done about it. And so um, thank you, Brad and the team um, for addressing those concerns. Um, I know that in community, we've started to have other questions around um, universal design and making sure that we're designing for communities in an inclusive manner. But I think that that's probably going to be a conversation that we have as a team um, moving forward. But as, as for now, I, I don't have any questions, but thank you all. Thank you, Myra. Um, I'm going to actually do a little bit of a roll call. I, I have several questions, but I'll wait for the end. But Maria, I see your mute is off. I'm wondering, do you have any additional questions? And this is not specific to the accessibility, only um, to the accessibility yeah. questions that, um, that Randy brought forward last month, but anything specific to the communities that you engage with, that you serve um, as impacted by EHA? 
Yeah, I had a, actually a follow-up question that kind of relates to what Daryl was saying, Brad. Um, I know last time I asked about, you know, how we address um, middle, missing middle housing and high opportunity areas. How do we um, create incentives in those areas, kind of in that middle area, missing middle area? And the response was, you know, the zoning, that zoning process needs to be involved, right? That has to come first. And I guess my question is, you know, to the extent zoning makes those kinds of considerations and changes, then how does that then, you know, like the feedback loop to incentives in the um, EHA um, to help encourage that, you know, how, how would that work? I mean, is there opportunity for um, new incentives that haven't been contemplated so far because of the limitations that you, you mentioned last time? Sure, and just to clarify, Maria, you mean when you say missing middle, because it can be it can mean a couple of different yes, things. Yes, not income. About the, first, first this, and then yeah, we can talk about income too. But yes, I'm talking about um, building type. Yes, I know it's confusing. I need yeah, to, and, and, and this is something that, that, that does you know come up a lot as, as part of the conversation because to some extent we are talking about land use implications. Um, you know, Blueprint Denver does kind of call out the need to kind of introduce missing middle type typologies and and have plans in place, neighborhood local plans to, you know, introduce kind of gentle density or whatever you want to call it, but kind of the, yeah. the product types that we're not getting a lot of four plexes, six plex kind of developments. Um, again, that 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 is a larger kind of zoning code conversation that's probably better addressed by my peers in community planning and development, but it does implicate, right, EHA. And, and so we, we do have incentives and we know that that, that, that that missing middle typology is also where a lot of the accessibility in terms of housing cost lives serving perhaps the other missing middle conversation which is around the kind of incomes that aren't aren't served directly by much of host programs but aren't um, available in the in the kind of unrestricted marketplace either and so I, i'm talking in circles but the short answer is i think they're designed to work together right that's why this is a joint effort between cpd and and host but i think the real impact to to change those kinds of typologies need to take place at the neighborhood planning levels and ultimately a citywide kind of land use zoning conversation that that, that is kind of too large, I think, for EHA to, to stomach in one in one process. Right. I guess what I'm getting to is like the, the EHA is providing incentives. Right. I mean, and I guess that's what I'm trying to say is, you know, how does it flex and grow as these zoning changes happen so that sure. those kinds of incentives are then directed? Yeah to these, you know, new opportunities, right? For, for lower income housing. Yeah, and every, so every one of the incentives that we have in there, Maria, be it a, a parking reduction or permit fee or potential height increases are all kind of informed by Blueprint Denver and, and the neighborhood plans that are in it. So they're designed to work within the context of, of kind of our citywide land use policies. And so, you know, as, as the land use policies change, potential for additional incentives related to EHA will avail themselves and, and we will certainly okay. you know, want to stay on top. I think I got bogged down by like the detail that's in the EHA. It's easy, it's easy and to so do. Then, so then thinking that means that's it, that's your chance, that's it's over. You know I mean? It, no, in it's, the it's meant to be, other... you know, we want it to be consistent, okay. but it's a living and like any policy, right? It's living and breathing and there are opportunities to change as realities change, as opportunities prevent themselves. Mm-hmm, okay. All right, thank you. This may muddy the waters a little bit for you, Maria, and, and, and this is to Brad, but for our Blueprint, I think they have a year over year kind of a report out as to kind of impacts or targets. Maybe it's year over year or every three years. It's between one to three years, because I know within the Denver Wright process, they each had an annual of some level report. There's opportunities for area plans and others to inform and change what Blueprint says. So to Maria's point that she was making, and actually, let me just own that point. I'll own this point then, um, that for EHA being so, um, I think you're starting really broad. And I understand the opportunity to get an inclusive, inclusionary housing uh, plan through council may be tougher if you start being extremely specific, especially since Blueprint and other plans speak to some of these um, targets or these issues for, 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 for whether it's code or whether it's building type, et cetera. Um, 
where I'm having some questions from folks is that with it being so broad and not specifically communicating, not, not just to missing middle, but for example, the incentives specific to housing with three to four bedrooms. Now, blueprint and area plans talk to based on where you're zoned, um, what is um, 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 optional housing types, what are current incentives. EHA is providing additional incentives. I would love for you to talk through why is not there, oh, what's the thinking behind not being specific as to the housing type that's necessary? Um, three to four bedrooms within the affordability incentives for, the, for what EHA is targeting, I think is necessary for families to be able to stay in Denver. Um, most families would require more than a one or two bedroom, but I don't see within EHA explicitly look, listing priorities or uh, incentives towards the type of household that families aren't able to have in Denver that are causing them to leave Denver. That may be in a prioritization plan coming forward. I don't know, but I'm just kind of curious to the thinking why it seems so broad where we have data showing specifically who's being harmed by not having a very robust inclusionary housing um, process in place outside of linkage fees. That's a lot. I apologize. But. <laughs> no, it, it is a lot, and 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 you're right to ask it. And 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 again, this isn't something that we haven't kind of heard or, or discussed, right? I think part of the challenge, right, is that we don't necessarily, especially within the planning realm, have the ability to kind of overly dictate to somebody what they have to build on their on their multifamily residential site. We can try to do what we can to incentivize it, and and we're and we are doing that. So we have one the option of kind of these negotiated agreements where you know we've indicated that we would be willing to kind of lower the number of the overall units in, you know, included in the development if in exchange, those units were skewed towards three and four bedroom, larger family style units, but importantly also have the right, you know, kind of amenities and incentives, not incentives, but amenities and features in place, right? Because I think we've also seen from other communities like Portland that tried to kind of introduce this thing. And what they ended up getting was instead of, you know, four one bedrooms, they got one four bedroom. In a, in a community surrounded by studios and one bedrooms and you end up getting four roommates right to live together because the building and the amenities and the location don't lean themselves towards family friendly uses there isn't a tile lot there isn't a computer lot right it's 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 more you know amenities driven towards kind of urban single professional type housing right and so what we can do is build in flexibility to try to incentivize those outcomes where we can be it through a negotiated agreement or a land swap or whatever the case may be. But we, we, we've we learned that it's not as simple as just saying, you know, you have to include three and four bedroom units, you know, in your development period, because that doesn't necessarily lead to the outcomes that we're trying to, to address based on what we've learned internally and what we've seen from other communities. Correct. And I'll stop and I'll go around the room, but I just want to say, yeah, mandates and say a developer has to do three to four bedrooms is really not what I'm, I'm, I'm stating, but simply the, the idea of, uh, the within the language somewhere within EHA stating clearly, we know from data, um, and I don't know if that Melanie could speak to what MDHI has put forward or any of the other housing um, displacement uh, reports that came out this first quarter already, that these are the folks who are impacted. Um, this is why this proposal is going through. We aren't saying that you must do these things, but these are the remedy, this is what we're trying to remedy. I'm, that's where I'm not, I'm not seeing kind of the why for community members. This feels very much like a roadmap for, um, um, for community planning and development to inform existing plans. So uh, parts of it, but the piece of how it hits people and families who want to stay in Denver, I'm not seeing it as clearly. So I don't know how, how better to articulate that. And maybe within the, um, the policy prioritization piece, we can get really deep and that can be attached as an addendum to this, but that's where I'm seeing an opportunity with this plan. It, it feels very much the people who do planning and zoning, they, this is their plan. But if I'm reading it as just a rank and file person in Denver wanting to stay in Denver, I'm not seeing myself. So that's commentary. Let me see if there's other questions from folks. And then I have a, maybe a few other questions to the end before we transition. Thomas, I see your mute is off. Um, do you have uh, additional questions? And I'm going to come through to each one to everyone on HSS just to make sure before we, we let Brad go. 
Um, I just wanted to say thank you again for, uh, you know, hearing, you know, some of the things that we were saying um, and then having all these innovative processes and, you know, all these new things that are coming out. Um, I'm just excited about, you know, seeing the track record and seeing how these things develop. Thank you, Thomas. And thank you for inviting us to the uh, Native American Housing Circle conversation earlier this week. We appreciated that opportunity as well. You're welcome. Thank you, Thomas. And I see that Josh I have to drop off. Josh, do you have any questions for Brad before you have to leave us? No, I don't. I don't have any questions um, for this conversation this morning. Um, it, it seems like there is a whole lot of great work happening to ensure that we have the right housing in place to serve um, all of um, our folks here in Denver. So I appreciate that. And, um, you know, as always, um, this is uh, this is good work and uh, I am happy to be here with, with all of you. Thanks so much, Josh. Jenny, I'm wondering, do you have any additional questions for, for Brad? Uh, no, I, I don't. I have the um, benefit of being part of the task force working on the policy. So I think I have peppered Brad with my questions and other forums. <laughs> Thank you, Brad. No problem. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, Melanie, any questions uh, for Brad and team? Yeah, hey, Daryl, thanks. Um, I don't think I actually have any additional questions. I appreciate the level of detail and thought that others have really dug in on. Um, so nothing else that's coming to mind right now. And then Marsha, I don't wanna miss you. Any additional questions that you may have? Uh, no, not at this time. Okay, let me look around. Did I miss any HSA? members. I'm kind of looking through my laptop. Sometimes I miss faces. So if I didn't call you, I'm going back through. I think I called everyone. Uh, I think I did. So my final comment, Brad, for you, and I know you spoke to this, but I, I just wanted to, to touch back on um, centering on kind of racial equity within uh, the process. I know EHA is set for that. Um, very curious as far as um, I, I recommended maybe in the um, the 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 preface of the, the 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 plan or somewhere within the narrative as the plan begins to speak to kind of the impacts of on um, racial parties specifically uh, black and brown communities and their um, in, impact by. Um, Denver not being uh, affordable for so many uh, folks, having something within EHA, even if though it's not, there is no way to do a target uh, for uh, communities of color to be um, the priority. I'm curious as to if there is an opportunity as folks read why what the EHA's uh, purpose and why EHA is being developed for that to be discussed a little bit in the beginning as far as the disproportionate, disproportionate impact to black and brown families as far as affordability and the ability to remain in Denver? Sure, I think there's probably, there's absolutely a, uh, an opportunity to, to better address that and we'll have that conversation. I, again, I think as, as you all have seen in our strategic plan, right, race equity is front and center and everything that we're doing within HOST, which includes expanding housing affordability in these efforts. So again, it's, it's I think you're right to point out that every opportunity that we can, we should elevate that, um, not assume that it's kind of a given. And so, you know, we, we will have, I will bring that back to the team and, and, and see what we can do to better, better address that. But I'm excited about all the efforts that my department's undertaking in that regard this year and into the future to, to address that longstanding and generational concern. So Brad, I think that's it for us. Uh, thank you so much. I mean, I am, uh, appreciate your willingness to engage in so many community meetings to come back a second time to Hassan and, and meet and speak with us and also to really respond to the questions that we have. You didn't just ignore what Randy and Myra and others said, you really did a lot of work within the last few weeks to address that, to identify how it's being addressed. And that demonstrates a level of transparency that is greatly appreciated, I know by this board and by the community. So thank you for the good work that you're doing and that for uh, CPD and this work. And we look forward to continuing collaborating with you. 
Thank you for having me. I warmed them up for you, Renee. Good luck. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. Great job, as always. Uh, well, assuming it's my turn to kind of step forward, I, <laughs> yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I just want to open by introducing myself. I'm, I, I see some, um, some familiar faces, some folks I've known for quite some time on the, I know on the committee, but then there's several of you that I haven't met. So I wanted to take the opportunity to introduce myself to, to thank Britta for the warm welcome. And I've received a warm welcome throughout, but um, uh, for, for the HSSA board, I know this is the first opportunity that I've had to uh, come before you introduce myself and we're just coming in and diving right in uh, to, to share what we're doing in the housing opportunity. But um, as for my own personal background, um, as Britta mentioned, I am coming here from the city of Boulder. Uh, I had been there uh, for roughly three years as the community investment program manager, manage, managing the roughly um, 12 to $15 million a year that they would, were investing into affordable housing. Uh, but I, I'm fortunate that I've had um, a lengthy career in affordable housing that's kind of come from a variety of perspectives um, that uh, started in housing developments. I was uh, uh, initially um, a housing developer for the Uptown Partnership, which is a nonprofit that no longer exists, and they dispersed to their portfolio. I went from Uptown Partnership to the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless, where I actually first met Britta um, many years ago. Uh, and was a developer on that team. Um, and then I went into roughly 10 years of um, uh, consulting work and travel where I worked on a variety of, uh, of affordable housing projects from a, from a variety of perspectives of financing applications, um, housing need assess needs assessments and for full transparency, a portion of that I was, uh, I was working very closely with Jenny Rogers from the, from the committee. Um, in one of her, when she had her, her prior um, business. Um, and uh, after a few years of living overseas, I returned and, and came back with a little bit more of a finance focus and spent three years with um, Mile High Community Loan Fund, which is currently um, Impact Development Fund uh, and a CDFI that had a focus and mission in affordable housing. Um, and it was from there that I went to the city of Boulder um, to, um, as I said, manage their community investments. Uh, and I wasn't um, necessarily looking looking to leave Boulder. I think they're doing some great work. But once when I learned of the opportunity to join the team here at Host and to take a leadership role um, with the with the scale of activities that are going on and all the exciting initiatives, it was just something that I couldn't. Uh, and to work under Britta's leadership, um, it was just something that I couldn't turn down. So I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I'm you know doing my best to fill in. The big shoes that were left behind by Deborah Bustos, who's now happily retired, uh, taking some well-deserved rest. Um, and, um, and you know, one of the legacies, legacies that uh, one of many legacies that Deborah left behind was to build an amazing team. So I think that's helped in my transition. Um, and so I want to make sure I acknowledge the team that's on the call here with me here. Um, that includes um, Brad Weinig, who you've all been introduced to, and is doing a, a tremendous job leading our. EHA efforts and that just that incredible initiative that's going across a couple of our divisions. And then he also oversees um, the catalytic projects, the negotiate agreements and our um, Metro down payment assistance program. Um, so I'm just thrilled to be working with, with Brad and to just dive in and have been continually impressed with the great work that he's done to move this initiative along and the great progress that he's made in, in the the brief, the one year that he's been here with the city. So Brad's, uh, you're familiar with Brad. Um, actually, if we could go to the next slide, that would be great because we'll remind me, make sure I don't um, miss anybody. Um, Jennifer Balcom is also on the call here with us. She is our director of development and preservation. So she leads our housing development officer team to get the investments out and do the underwriting and talk to our partners. Obviously, recognizing that the city um, does not is not um, owned in many cases, we need our partners to to put forth the projects and to um, um, come to us with our ideas where we can share what our priorities are, and then provide gap funding as as is necessary through the variety of sources that we have available. Um, we also have Maureen uh, Morley, who leads our asset management and compliance team. And as she's done a tremendous job of building systems and policies and procedures to really strengthen our, our, um, our abilities in that area of asset management and compliance. She's built a great team 
and you know, doing that important part of the work that sometimes doesn't get all of as much attention, but is critically important to ensuring the stability of our portfolio and that we're not, as we're building in units, that we're getting what we intended and that we're not losing them on the back end to, um, to being out of compliance or um, not living up to the obligations that a partner might have set when they, um, when they initially um, received funding or, or negotiated with the city. And then we also have Matt Carlock, who's not on the call today because he's taken a well-deserved break. And he is our operations uh, manager and he oversees all of our contracts and, and um, environmental reviews and that team that really does the, the work to keep, um, to keep our, our funding moving and um, uh, ensure that we are able to close on deals and, and provide uh, and do it according to um, established processes and systems. So um, it's, I'm, and then, you know, below these, um, the four directors, there's a great team of dedicated and focused and, and staff. And I've just, I've been fortunate to spend a portion of my ramp up time meeting with a lot of the team one-on-one -on -one to understand how their roles interact and what, what they're bringing to the table. And I've just been continually impressed with the uh, level of uh, experience and passion um, and compassion uh, and expertise that they bring to the table. So I'm just, again, thrilled to be, um, to be here as a part of that team. Um, and of course, in addition to our in the internal resources we have, we also have um, one of the things that I was drawn to is the great external partners that we have, um, including this HSSA advisory team. So um, I appreciate, I want to make sure I express to you my thanks for your, your time and dedication to these to these important issues and the feedback that you provide to us in this work, recognizing that it is critically important and your, um, your voice in the process can really help us pro provide direction, um, the direction that we need and maybe some focus that we need. So, um, you know, I, I know that if we could go to the next slide, uh, obviously there, you're coming at this from a place of commitment and, and, and passion as well. Um, I think we're all sort of familiar with um, the need for affordable housing, um, but there is, um, if we can move to the next slide, I'm not sure, Katie, if that's, but there we are. I want to make sure I wasn't missing something. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I'm sure you all are, I don't want to spend a ton of time on this, on this slide because I think most folks are familiar with it, but I wanted to just kind of set that baseline of when we're talking about affordable housing, we're talking about um, housing that does not take up more than 30% of a household's income. Um, and that we can do that through a variety of ways where we're, there's dedicated uh, housing that comes with covenants and naturally occurring housing that maybe it's just, it's not formally required to do so, but they provide the units at, at a price before market, which we're not seeing as many of those anymore. And we, um, but we are of course focused on preserving as many of those as we can. And we come at this as a place from the city with the resources that we have available to subsidize affordable housing as it's being created to make sure it can um, reach some of the lower income households that are not addressed through, through um, the typical market. Um, and so I, I know, as I said, you, many of you are I'm sure are aware of these terms, but we wanna just provide the refresher and remind folks that there is a, um, I believe through Brad's work he's done, um, they've done some great work in sharing um, some affordable housing 101, um, resources and we remember that there was a um, uh, YouTube presentation out there I think that Katie is going to put in the chat in case anybody just wants to circle back for that to, to just refresh your memory. Um, so with that we can move on to the next slide of you know really why we're here and how we, the focus work that we do in the uh, housing opportunity group within host. Um, and I know we, um, a lot of this is going to be refresher for folks as well because you were heavily involved in our five-year strategic plan process and in our process of building an action plan. But as you probably recall, with the, the whole point of our five-year strategic plan is um, to create um, a vision for what we wanted to achieve within five years in, in across a wide array of, of host activities. But specific to housing opportunity, our, the, the, the vision and direction that we're going is to have make sure ensure that residents have equitable access to a wide variety of housing options that meet their affordability needs and the opportunity to increase wealth through, through home ownership. So that is sort of our, our within housing opportunity, our, our, our sort of guiding principle. And, you know, we, and we translated that into some specific goals for housing opportunities, uh, for the housing opportunity group. Um, 
which I've been spending, of course, a lot of time uh, getting up to speed on these as well in my first uh, five weeks or so that I've been in the job. Uh, but if we if we could turn the, if we could transition to the next slide, um, obviously you're familiar with many of the goals that we set. But the first one we set for housing opportunity, based on some of the community feedback we received, um, our, our first goal was to expand access to affordable housing opportunities. Uh, and of course, we're doing that with a with a eye towards um, specific targets, and we we were looking at increasing the portfolio the the availability of income restricted homes from 7% to 8% through the creation and preservation of 7,000 um, rental and home ownership units. Um, and so that's, again, we set a, on a, a very aggressive goal. Um, and then we also called out those elements, as you mentioned, Daryl, that, that we've seen that there needs to, there's a dearth of, um, of options and we need to create more, we need to focus a lot of the efforts of those 7,000 units on deeper affordability. Um, on three or more bedroom units to allow families to remain in, in the city and to create um, 900 supportive housing apartments to address, to create a, a pipeline by which um, uh, our community members who are, who are unhoused have a, have a, have a way to um, be transitioned into housing and receive the type of support that they need to make sure that they are successful and can remain housed. Um, we're also uh, the tan one of the other tangible goals we set related to um, expanding access to affordable housing opportunities is that um, reducing the rate of, of cost burden, which is, um, you know, if affordable housing is folks are spending 30% or less of their monthly income um, of their annual income on their housing costs. Um, if they are spending more than that, then they're considered to be house uh, cost burdened and they don't have the uh, funds available for um, a sufficient funds for for other basic needs like um, food, medical bills, um, uh, discretionary spending that they might need to take. So um, we were we'd like to reduce that rate of uh, those that are housing cost burden from fifty nine percent to fifty one percent to ensure that there is greater stability um, and that there aren't as many folks um, spending too much on their housing costs and putting them at risk for um, you know that one. Um, on an unplanned expense that that just sends them into a spiral. So we want to make sure they have access to those options. Um, our second goal within housing opportunity, as you're familiar with, is to pre preserve existing um, affordable homes. Um, we, as part of that five-year plan, we're seeking by 2026 to preserve at least 950 apartments and for sale homes. And then we and we've divided that into a focus of um, rental rental units, which we were aiming to preserve at least 600 um, apartments uh, for rental properties and income restricted rental properties and 350 affordable homes within our home ownership program um, over the next five years. Uh, and, and putting that focus where the covenants are expiring over the next five years to ensure that they can remain part of the affordable housing portfolio. And finally, um, our third goal for housing opportunities, many of you probably will recall, is to um, is to expand home ownership opportunities. And we've heard that a lot. That that um, we want to create that pipeline of opportunities from from the lowest income, but also allow folks to graduate, if you will, up to home ownership opportunities, um, if that's something that they want to pursue. Um, so we are. As part of the strategic plan, we set the aggressive goal that hosts and, and our partners, of course, because their partners are, are building these units, um, that they we increase the home ownership rate for households earning 80% um, from what the current uh, 36% up to 41%. Um, and the way we're going to do that is by assisting 10,000 households with the variety of services they might need to access that homeowner home ownership opportunity. Whether that be home, home buyer counseling, down payment assistance, um, direct subsidies, or the mandatory housing policies um, like EHA that are creating more opportunities um, in um, as other market units are coming on to put into place, where they create opportunities for um, affordable home ownership as well. And then we're as 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 you mentioned, we're doing this all with the lens of of um, of equity in the work that we do, but and but specifically in home ownership opportunities, we recognize that the home ownership rate for 
uh, communities of color has is is dis is not proportionate to the population, and it's and there really has been obviously uh, generations and historical factors that have limited the home ownership rate for communities of our communities of color. So we want to increase the rates, put a specific focus on those BIPOC households um, to increase the home ownership rate from forty one percent to forty five percent. And I, the, you know, tangibly, the way we do that is by assisting at least uh, 4,600 households in gaining that access to home ownership opportunities through the variety of services. So this is also an area, again, we're doing all of our work with an eye on equity, but in these home ownership opportunities, it's, it's specifically called out as one of our goals um, that, we, that we are um, you know, working hard and keeping its, its front and center in the work that we're doing in this arena. So across those three goals, of course, that was in the, within the five-year plan, and we have, by 2026, um, we have we have these uh, aggressive goals to reach uh, a wide variety of households. But we, um, as you're aware, we distilled that down to a 2022 action plan um, that, that shows up in the next slide um, that highlights the priorities and really what we're focusing on in in 2022. Already, you know, a month and a half into 2022. But our, our primary focus is that first opportunity, housing opportunity goal of expanding affordable housing opportunities for, for our community. And uh, within this goal, our specific priorities um, are to expand the, the, um, the rental housing, um, the, the income restricted housing stock um, and to support the development and preservation of about 1400 total homes, including 185 units of supportive housing. So we've, you know, of those 7,000 that we're looking to do before 2026, we've set an aggressive goal of four, we're gonna get to work on 1400 of those in the, the year 2022 to set us off on a, on a good pace to reach our five-year goal. And then we've specifically called out these supportive housing units uh, because we, the 185 supportive housing units, because we recognize that as a priority from our mayor and from the community as well to um, really create that pipeline for the unhoused to get them into the type of housing that is going to um, uh, allow them to remain housed and, and to receive the services that they that they may need. Um, we are our, our other key priority for um, for 2022 is to um, make the uh, make the approval and review process easier for these affordable housing projects that we are aiming so hard to get online uh, and and doing that in part with a partnership with other city agencies like CPD. Uh, it's another place in which we're coordinating and collaborating with them, but we are looking to implement a, an affordable housing review team that would be a team dedicated to, to supporting the 100% affordable housing projects to ensure that they are not stalled in, in the CPD review process, that, um, that they are kind of, uh, they can hopefully get a, their own uh, swim lane, if you will, of moving through the process with um, a little bit of a some some oversight, some handholding to make sure they they don't get lost in the system and that we're not we're not creating unnecessary delays in getting these these critical units online, and that they can move forward um, to obviously to provide the housing to the community members and to help us move towards our goals. So this affordable housing review team um, has been as part of our plans where we've got um, staff. Uh, positions that have already been set aside and budget set aside and we're working through that process of how to best structure that team and ensure and, and coordinate and uh, we'll soon be moving on to I believe um, the hiring process to really get that team started and to make this uh, this special swim lane a reality we've done some pilot work right now but we're really looking to uh, expand it broader um, across the portfolio of uh, affordable housing projects that are coming into play. And finally, as you know, you've heard, we've spent a lot of time already talking about the expanding housing affordability and that expanding the role that um, market-based developments play in contributing to our overall uh, affordable housing goals and, and filling the needs, um, the city's housing needs. Um, so that work, um, as you're well aware, is, is really moved along at a great pace. It's done, it take, it's been, um, there's been a lot of the community engagement, your input obviously has been critical as well. And so we are moving that towards um, making that a reality and all through the various process steps of the process of 
community engagement and municipal code reviews and, and policies and those kinds of things. So um, again, I can't thank uh, Brad enough for his great leadership in, in leading that initiative. Um, so to dive in a little bit more on those specific, that those 1400 total homes that we're looking to produce in 2022, um, that we can break that 1400 units down into our specific targets across a variety of populations. If we can move to the next slide, please, Katie. Um, so of those 1400 homes we're making, we're looking to make, um, to create with our partners, 838 uh, rental homes that are serving that 30 to 80% AMI market. Um, and again, we pull out <clears throat> that need for deeply affordable and, and larger units. So among those 838 rental homes that we're looking to create in 2022, uh, we're looking at looking for a, roughly a third of 30% of them to be at or below 30% AMI. Um, so that would be 252 units. Um, and those are not specifically the supportive housing units that, that we call out separately as well, but these are just really targeted to, um, to that 30% uh, AMI. And then 63 of those units um, for three or, three or more bedrooms. Uh, we were looking to preserve 133 rental homes in that 30 to 80% AMI uh, uh, income level. Uh, we're looking to create 67 um, affordable for sale homes and to preserve uh, 83 um, for sale homes uh, in this year, in, in 2022. And then back to um, uh, you know, supportive housing, as I mentioned, they're not, they're not specifically included in that uh, deeply affordable, but we, we wanna uh, specifically call out the 185 units of, of truly supportive housing um, that, were, that will come with the necessary services um, and so there, those units, those 185 units also require services funding and support. And then there's still, uh, while we're kind of waiting to, as the EHA process moves through, um, through, through the process to get it actually rolled out, um, there are still the addition, additional opportunities where we're expecting roughly 100 units through negotiated agreements from market-based developers who are who are kind of currently in the pipeline and the, those are moving along as well. So that, I mean, those the, it's an audacious goal that we set within the strategic plan of the 7,000 units, but by breaking it down into this annual goal of 1,400 units and then these targeted, these targets for these specific uh, types of populations, I think it, it's helped us to really understand where we need to be and to track, um, to track how far we've come with the great help of our um, our data team, I know Jennifer Jennifer Bice is on the call and providing the type of data we need to really help us track our progress and to fine tune where we're going as we move throughout the year and through the full five year um, strategic plan. Um, so that's that was the the key pieces of our strategic plan or action plan that we wanted to, to make sure we put in front to set the stage and remind you of where we're going uh, and how we're tracking the work that we do. Um, but I, with that, I want to make sure I turn it over to you to, I know, to leave um, the time for the, the comments, the questions, the discussions that I know um, you are valuable to this conversation and, and part of the reason we have this strate strategic advisors team. So thank you for the opportunity to introduce myself and to um, share some of the great work that we've been doing. Renee, thank you so much. It's, it's, it will be great getting to know you better. Thank you for your leadership already. And thank you for the great presentation. Uh, Katie, I'll ask if you don't mind uh, going back to the last slide as we open for questions. I think I had a lot of information and it may inform some of the questions that we may have for Renee. Thank you so much, Katie. And let's start first with Randy. I saw your hand first and then uh, Maria. Thank you. Um, first of all, welcome Renee to host. Um, I'm wondering how much, how many of these numbers intertwine, like when you say 252 units uh, of deeply affordable, and then the next level is 63 units of three, three or more bedrooms, I assume that will intertwine where some of those three or more bedrooms will be deeply affordable. Some of them will include supportive housing. And I'm just wanting to make sure that I'm understanding that correctly. Uh, yes, I would, I would invite um, Jennifer Balcom, our develop, who's got the best view on our pipeline, and, and um, Jennifer Bice, who's, who, who kind of tracks our data. But I, we are looking at that, you know, that option to, to have these, you know, in, in an ideal scenario, they are combined and we have one unit that meets 
uh, that meets all three, that contributes to all three goals, um, whether deeply affordable or larger bedrooms. We want to specific, specifically call out the deeply affordable and three bedroom units as you as you rightly pointed out, that knowing that those are needs, and we need to try to um, keep those in mind in in the negotiations and conversations that we're having with our partners. Um, but I, I think um, either one of the Jennifers might be able to speak on how we're tracking that and what we're seeing in the in the pipeline to confirm that they are um, somewhat intertwined. The, the deeply affordable number of two forty two fifty two and the three bedroom units of 63 are both included as part of the 838 above. Yes. And, and in addition, the supportive housing number down below of 185 is included as part of that 838. Right, what I'm wondering is how many of those will cross paths, intertwine? Like, will you have deeply affordable units that are also three or more bedrooms and also provide supportive housing? Yes, potentially, yes. And so we, when we speak with developers, we, ne we negotiate, we are always in negotiation with developers on every project that comes to us for funding to ask them to provide more three bedroom units and more 30% AMI units. And so some of that, um, some of that is uh, gonna overlap depending on, on what we're able to negotiate with the developers as the projects come in. Okay, great. And then back to Renee, I'm sorry, the other question I had, um, you don't know me, but I'm the disabled guy that hear that um, I, I always push for um, transparency in providing accessible units. And I, I would just encourage you that when you, when you do these unit targets, that you also include some information about how many of those units you wanna make accessible um, whether through universal design or through um, just regular ADA units. Yes, I, pre I certainly the conversations that we've had um, that Brad has had as part of EHA over the last you know a few weeks have certainly um, kind of brought the issue of accessibility to um, to the top of our minds as across the variety of, of uh, affordable housing that we're that we're trying to pursue. And I think it's it's sort of in, ingrained in there as well. And while they might may not be specifically called out in there, I think we we are committed to working across the array of of, of um, you know a, a, the other pieces of the puzzle that that can truly, that it can impact this and then keeping it in mind as we're having the negotiations. With our with our partners as well to and to really track and understand um, where where we're making progress where we might still be if the, if if the needs uh, are increased if we have tangible data to to really help us set some to maybe uh, modify or or include within our goals um, the type of accessible units that you're speaking to. That'd be wonderful. I I like to be able to go back to my community and say, okay, here's a slide deck that shows what the city is doing as far as accessibility. So any information like that, that you can include on um, this type of thing would be greatly helpful. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that. Um, this, this, as you know, these are, these came out and this is how this came out of our 2022 action plan. And as we, we distill down the five-year strategic plan, um, but we will be, we'll be creating these action plans for each of our years moving forward uh, as well. So uh, we will certainly keep that in mind and I appreciate that input. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Renee and Jennifer. And Randy is, is uh, he focuses and he elevates uh, issues specific to folks um, um, living with different abilities, but he's also a leader in many other layers. So Randy, I accept your elevation of these issues, but know that we rely on you on on things that are inclusive of this, but also it's a plus for your voice and all of the other issues as well. Um, Thank Maria you. is uh, next. Hey, um, Renee, welcome. Uh, five weeks in, I guess. So we're, we're glad to have you here. Um, and this is really helpful. This, this slide is, is particularly helpful. And I'm, I'm always excited every time I hear repeated um, the focus on BIPOC home ownership and the fact that we're addressing um, displacement in this plan, um, that always brings me much joy. 
Um, I work for Habitat for Humanity of Metro Denver. So home ownership is my thing. Yes. So obviously that, that makes sense why, why um, that's, that's exciting and important. Um, I do have a question though. I, I was thinking about the work that Habitat and others are involved in, in addressing um, you know, BIPOC home ownership and in particular the displacement pressures that um, communities are facing so much in Denver right now. And um, in looking at the for sale home um, AMI levels, um, you know, we're working, for example, in Globeville, um, Elyria Swansea to help support um, a community land trust there. And, you know, the folks that are either have experienced displacement or at risk of displacement that we're seeking to provide home ownership to often fall below the levels, the AMI levels shown there. And so um, I was just curious, will there be additional, yeah, you know, I'm just thinking of those two priorities coming mm -hmm. together, um, yeah. anti-displacement, will there be, be additional um, assistance, um, support to help dig a little deeper into those AMI levels so that we're hitting those very folks that are prior the prioritization um, policy I'll learn more about um, uh -huh. next week. Um, those things are, are, are seeking to achieve. Um, yeah, I mean, I will speak. It's not specifically called out here, but I, but um, I, as part of my ramp up process, I've really, um, uh, I've had a chance to, as, as I mentioned, speak with the wide variety of our, our everybody on our team. Uh, was just recently brought up to speed on some of the equity work that's happening in our Metro DPA program and some some really exciting um, initiatives that we have to focus some of that down payment assistance on um, on communities of color that were that were traditionally left out of the uh, denied access to the home ownership pool. Um, and, and some really interesting programs that we're hoping to roll out um, by the spring on in that down payment program. But we do recognize that you know the, the deeper affordability and um, for community of colors uh, communities of color is 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 important. We're trying to to um, balance balance that with the variety of sources that are available for them. Recognizing we may need additional subsidy because obviously the construction costs mm -hmm. are continuing to go up. As you're, I'm sure you're well aware of um, that. That we have, um, we we need to recognize the costs are going up as well. Um, and we're we're doing some work also right now on setting uh, maximum home pricing and trying to um, understand what's happening in the market versus what's there and the need um, with the additional layer of of these goal these ambitious goals that we've set. Um, so I think it's something that we are definitely keeping in mind, recognizing if we wanna reach that goal that we may need to uh, tap into deeper affordability. Uh, and it's something that we'll be working through, uh, through throughout this year. Um, I wanna make sure I give um, Jennifer or, or Brad who leads leading the Metro, um, overseeing the part of the team that's seeing the Metro DPA program a chance to weigh in if there's any other elements that I'm, that I'm thinking of, but I appreciate you raising the, the concern to us as well, because it's something that we are, as we're looking at the home ownership um, arena that we are keeping in mind as well. I would say only that that um, Brad and also Maureen and I, and Maureen mm -hmm. in particular mm -hmm. has done a whole lot of work on our maximum sale prices and Brad and Maureen and I have had hours of debate and discussion about, about what the right answer is because with construction costs going up so much, we're afraid if we set um, maximum home prices too low that it just won't get built. And then we're afraid if we set it too high, people can't afford it. So that, you know, and, and if we fund more subsidy per house, then we can't fund as many houses. So there's just, there's so many different lenses on that problem and so many different important questions that are being asked. And I can, I can only, you know, we've, we've involved many staff internally <laughs> and, and I know that, uh, um, Green and Renee have had some discussions about it. So I, I, I will say only that it's being given, certainly being, being given its due consideration. And the answers I think are, are not, they're not clear and they're not easy about which way to go with that. And I'll just add from Metro DPA program. And this is something that my uh, colleague, Andrew Johnson, who was out on uh, vacation this week is 
much better versed in and is leading on, on behalf of our department. But the idea with the kind of social equity addition to the Metro DPA program is to add additional kind of grant supports to help reach down the income spectrum um, for households who can evidence that they or, or, or their descendants have been displaced from red line communities in Denver. So we, we, we have to kind of, we can't unfortunately directly or explicitly kind of restrict that program to, um, to BIPOC households because of fair housing obligations. We are trying to tie it to historical redlining, which we know obviously disproportionately impacted communities of color and therefore ideally will be you know, one, of, one of our major avenues towards increasing BIPOC home ownership. Uh, it's an exciting program. Um, I'm light on details at this point because we're still working them out internally, but as Renee said, it's coming up in the next couple of months, and um, if and when it's of interest to this group, happy to have Andrew um, come join and, and provide more details. That would be great. I would look forward to learning more about that. That's great. Right. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Jennifer Balcom and Renee for that answer. And Brad, um, as soon as Andrew is back from vacation, <laughs> He is invited to attend our March meeting, I, even if it's in the iterative steps. Uh, I think that is extremely uh, of stream uh, interest to members of this board. And it's uh, another thank you to your team and Renee's team for really diving into that. So absolutely would love right. as soon as um, he's available for him to right. be able to attend our March or April meeting. Right. So I guess Katie or Sabrina, whoever kind of runs yeah. the <laughs> agendas, you've taken a note. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, guys. I have a quick question and Marsha, I see your hand up and so I'll, I'll call on you next, but I, my question is specific to the data and uh, around this, these numbers. Uh, is uh, host leveraging, and, and Renee, maybe this is you or one of uh, the other leaders uh, by the name of Jennifer <laughs> on the call, uh, but for example, when you're speaking to kind of the increase of supportive housing, and there's a specific number for deeply affordable at 252. Is there a, a, a system, a program, a dashboard that's being leveraged to show how many units are ex currently in existence within the spectrum of housing? Um, how many are being leveraged? Uh, is there a certain system that you're using to know that this uh, housing is there? It can, to be able to meet these goals within 2022? And if there is, what system are you using and what's the transparency for either HSSA or community to see, hey, there are uh, uh, of these 252, these housing, this housing exists, this supportive housing is in these certain places and folks are placed into these housings in 2022. I want to defer probably to Jennifer Bice if she's still on the call, because um, I, I know that we've uh, we are very, very fortunate to have our expertise in in leading our data team. And, you know, a lot of what we do is, is focused on the data to to really keep us hold us accountable, as you said, and to make sure that we're moving in the right direction. I know we've got a great affordable housing dashboard that is already available online, but I want to make sure that we, I let our expert really speak to it to give you um, the full answer. Thanks, Renee, and uh, thanks, Daryl, again for the question. Um, so I did pop the link to our current affordable housing dashboard in the chat, um, just so folks can check that out. But that that's our current kind of public-facing tool. Um, we are excited to be coming, I think, next at next month's meeting to talk about our plans for a new public-facing dashboard in line with the strategic plan, so we can get more into some of those details next month. But in terms of what we have today, um, in that dashboard, you'll see a number of different tabs. Um, there's information on market conditions as well as the total number of overall income restricted units we have in Denver. Um, those units are also mapped so you can see where they are and you can filter on um, some different criteria like is the unit open and available for occupancy? Is it under construction? Um, which neighborhoods is it in? Um, those types of things. Um, it does not currently have, um, that map does not currently have the overlay of AMI level, um, but in our five-year strategic plan, we did commit to providing reporting on more granular um, AMI levels in terms of the number of units we're creating and preserving. Um, so that's something that we're looking at for the new dashboard. You'll also see, based on the the AMI categories that were used in our previous uh, strategic plan, housing and inclusive Denver, 
you'll see how many units were created and preserved by year um, in, in different AMI categories. So there's a current tool to help with some of those questions, but we're really looking to build something new that aligns to this strategic plan and have been having conversations internally about how we're tracking particularly our development and preservation work um, so that uh, we have transparency around these goals and our pipeline. Hey, I love this, Jennifer. I'm wondering, is this in um, collaboration with Housing Connector or is this is something um, built through the city? The tool that I put in the chat is something that my team maintains here within the Department of Housing Stability. So this is our own in-house tool, um, originally built to align with the goals of Housing and Inclusive Denver, but it also just has a real wealth of information about our affordable housing stock in Denver. It's a great tool, Jennifer. I, I haven't uh, reviewed it um, before just now. So thank you so much for sharing. And Masha, let me turn to you for your question. Oh, thank you um, for giving me an opportunity. I wanted to uh, certainly welcome Renee. Um, so, so grateful that you're part of um, an amazing housing agency. Um, I wanted to just ask that in the next um, <clears throat> meeting that we look at more than just down payment assistance. And I know that Brad had mentioned about grant and grant funding um, that you guys are working on. Um, but I also want to just, you know, go back and, and look at some other streams of support, things like match funding. Um, working and partnering with DHA, um, Denver Community Credit Union, and other financial institutes that help individuals that may not qualify for down payment assistance. Um, being one of those people, I realized, I, and I didn't know it at the time, but I realized how critical uh, the Neighborhood Lift Grant was. Um, in terms of looking at the mortgage, I mean, the market rate, um, as well as being able to afford to purchase inside of Denver. We, we say one thing, um, you know, we say affordable, but then we have to look at what is affordable, right? And so when we, we take a look back, I know that partnerships have helped lots of people that is in a particular area of AMI and, and even not, you can be 30% AMI and still um, <clears throat> not meet the, the requirements for down payment assistance. So I just wanna encourage you to look at other partnerships and strengthening those partnerships um, to bring that into the focus for the um, target for the housing units. Um, and, and definitely kudos, you guys are, you know, doing a, an amazing job, but also wanted to just make mention if these housing units are available to an array or array of family structures, or is this just for, you know, parents, folks with kids, is it single adults, who, who will this housing project um, target? Um, in terms of meeting those demands. Thank, thank you for that input. I, I just want to make sure I understand the last portion of your question. Um, are you looking for um, for more detailed information about how they how projects are targeted or? Um, I'm sorry if, if maybe I just want to make sure I understand what we what you're looking to. Thank use. you, Renee, because sometimes I get too passionate about this kind of thing <laughs> yeah. called housing. I want to make sure we're yeah, yeah. yeah. and well, and it's that. important. But what I'm asking is the next time we you present or uh, provide information, can we add who would be part of the target? If that is single parents, if that is uh, families, is is this um, housing structure for anyone that meets the AMI, you know, is there um, any separation with support based on the structure of the family? Okay. And then also, if you're using any kind of partnership, 
to support grant funding or assistance other than down payment assistance, what mm -hmm. that would be. Okay. And, and Renee, if you're if you're able to do that in two minutes, because we're going to be closing, because we're at the end of we're at the bottom of the hour, and we want to be respectful for everyone's time. We know we're going to get back to Masha, just like we we're able to respond back to some of the questions at the end of last month's meeting. Yes. So I'll turn it yeah. over to you for the last two minutes. I think that would be. I think it would, uh, um, I, I'd be happy to defer the time, and we can circle back to make sure that we're kind of at, we're providing the type of information that 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 you're asking for, and in a in a valuable way then that, that I'm not just kind of speaking off the cuff. There's so much new that's come at me. I don't want to, um, I don't want to misspeak in this, in this direct regard. So I think be happy to circle back to this, um, in their, in their next meeting as we did with Brad, some of Brad's work today. And we don't have to wait for a meeting. Renee. Okay. Um, okay. you could, you could, you could get back in touch with me. I think a couple of the people you work with might already have my contact information. Okay. Yes. I'm sure. um, but yeah, feel free. I, I'm just, okay. I want to be clear what the target is. That's my whole point. Okay. All right. Thanks so much, Marsha. Thank you so much, Renee. Thank you so much, Britta and Brad and team for your presentation and answering our questions. Um, to both of the Jennifers, we're putting, going deeper into um, the responses uh, to questions that were asked. We really do appreciate the collaboration with host. We appreciate the work that each of you do on a daily basis. This is an important, an, uh, uh, impactful work. And we thank you for your dedication. Our next meeting is March 18th from 10 to 11.30. Thank you all for spending this Friday with us and enjoy the rest of your day and your weekends. Thank you so much. Thank you. So